Hello and welcome to another episode of the Lead and Thrive podcast, the podcast where we speak with top leaders in consumer goods and retail to go deep into their most significant leadership experiences. Uh, and I'm your host, Daniel Torres, here at Dwyer Partners. The first company you join and you spend some years in is likely to make a huge impact on the rest of your career. Starting in a company that sets you up for success on the technical side, but especially in leadership abilities, is key. One of the companies that generated amazing leaders in the last few years is uh, Target, retailer that tends to be overlooked, probably eclipsed by its larger rivals, Amazon and Walmart, for example. But it's actually a company that's done very well in the last few years, and especially in the pandemic environment has really thrived. And I happen to know some amazing leaders that have started at Target and now are sitting on executive teams, especially in the North American retail space. One of the great people that I know that started at Target is my guest today. This is Matt Terry, who's currently the Chief Logistics and People Officer at Very Shop, a recently founded e-commerce player. I've invited him to better understand how Target was able to develop him and a cohort of executives into the leaders they are today. Well, hi, Matt. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, it's very cold here, but thank you for having me. It's yeah, I know. Here. We were just talking before we started recording about Fahrenheit and Celsius and uh, how cold it is over there, <laughs> which is, I think you said minus 10 Celsius, right? Yes, that is unfortunately correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us today. And maybe as a matter of introduction, maybe you can tell a bit the audience a bit about what yourself and what you do currently. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Matt Terry. I'm the chief logistics and people officer for a company called Verishop. I think I might be the only person who has that exact title. It's not a normal combination. So my team kind of has two different portfolios. On the one hand, I have HR with all the traditional functions there of building culture hiring, performance management, and in today's world with kind of a dispersed workforce due to the pandemic, trying to figure out how do you be remote first and how do you manage those difficulties and just those differences in the world today. Yeah. And then the other part of my team is logistics and operations. So much more traditional running of warehouses. Uh, we're a social e-commerce company. So it's mainly parcel delivery, but you know we import goods, we help manage the warehouses. We have a third-party distribution network as well through dropship and marketplace. So we work with the vendors on basically everything from the time a customer places an order to the time that order arrives at their door. So packaging, transportation, shipping, returns, exchanges, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned social e-commerce. What does that mean exactly? No, that's a really good question. And it's something that you know, in Southeast Asia, there's quite a few companies that are already in this space. It's something that's a little newer here in the United States. Companies like Instagram are going down this path, but Verishop is really built on a premise of leading with this mentality. So when we talk about social e-commerce, our main interface is through our app. And our app is a, a scrolling feed that really Think of Verishop as a platform mm -hmm. where sellers can come onto the platform and connect in a new way with their customers. And within this platform, we've got multiple places that, that they can come together. But that feed within our application is meant to be entertaining, meant to connect people. And at the end of the day, we talk about the difference between shopping and buying. Okay. In our thoughts, buying our transactional activities to get the things I need in my life. Shopping is a, a more social, emotional interaction to get the things I want in my life. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, shopping was done with your friends and your family, like at a mall. Yeah. Today's world isn't great about that. A lot of buying in e-commerce is lonely. So we actually have this capability called Shop Party, where within the app, you can invite multiple friends and family and you guys, it's kind of like the equivalent of FaceTiming and seeing what each other is looking for at the same time. You can see each other's carts. You can comment on what you're buying. We provide discounts, you know, depending on people shopping together. 
but it's bringing that social aspect to the shopping experience. Yeah, well, very interesting. Is this like kind of similar to the Tmall of like the Chinese e-commerce model? I think is more similar to this than what we know in the West. I believe. No, I think that that's a, that's a really good analogy. It's not a, a one for one exact same, uh, but yes, that concept. It's just much more robust in Southeast Asia right now. Yeah, yeah. And something you didn't mention, Matt, which I think is relevant, is the fact that Berry Shop is still a very young company. How old is it again? Yeah, so we were founded in November of 2018, and we shipped our first products in June of 2019. So, uh, yeah, this the company is just a little over two years old. Yeah, and you were employee number what, number five or number four or three even? I am lucky enough to be number four. We had number two four. founders, one wonderful individual who was with the company before me, and then I was number four. Very cool. And I think that one thing that is very interesting about your background, Matt, is the fact that you come, you started your career at Target. If I'm not wrong, you started there like right after college, right? Yeah, I was at Target probably within under six months after graduating college. Okay. So the thing about Target is that I think that there's a lot of noise, a lot of news about Amazon, Walmart, and that they're a bit of like in their shadow, but they're obviously a very successful retailer. I mean, I don't, I think they're pretty far away from those two still, no, in terms of market cap and revenues. Yeah, there's a, a pretty big size difference. And, and there's just a very different mentality at Target versus those retailers. I mean, at the end of the day, they're all companies that like buy things and then resell them. Yeah. But kind of what's the core ethos and how they run the companies? Uh, there, there are some very key differences. Is it fair to say, though, that they would be the number three? Yeah, I... I technically think Kroger might actually be in there as well, uh-huh. just from a total dollar standpoint. But yeah, Amazon, Walmart, Kroger, and then Target's probably right in that space below there. Costco's also probably near there. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing that's always, and we've we've talked about that through the years, Matt, but uh, the thing that's always caught my attention about Target is the number of leaders in other industries sorry, in other companies that they are in the executive teams that come from Target. So we know, you know, Neiman Marcus, what else we have? Tractor Supply, for example, is led by former Target. And I think people that you work with, I don't know if any others come to mind, but this, I think people actually at Amazon coming from Target as well, people from Walmart. So kind of like, I feel like executives coming from Target punch above their weight in terms of the their trajectory? Oh, I think that's really fair. And it, it's a cross target that that's the case. But specifically in the distribution network, hmm. there are individuals and people that I worked side by side with uh, in this very specific time frame in target distribution's history that are now everywhere, especially in retail. Yeah. I mean, Ulta, JC Penny. Uh, yeah, there's, there's just really... Oh, yeah, Ulta as well. Yeah, across all of those. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and on top of it, a lot of the retailers where they've gone have actually done quite well. When you joined Target, did you have to go through a very thorough selection process or anything? Was it a kind of Procter and Gamble approach where they only hired the top students? No, and I'll tell you what. I'll tell you my joining Target story uh-huh. fully transparently, and I don't <laughs> tell everyone all this detail. But I graduated college, and my last two years in college, I was delivering pizza to kind of like pay my way and finish off being able to eat and pay rent and all these things as I was ending college. And I had some plans on what I wanted to do, but originally I was going to go to law school, and I decided oh, wow. I didn't want to go that path. So one day I accepted an offer to be a manager at the pizza restaurant I was working at. And when I was growing up, there was no such thing as thinking like, when I grow up, I want to be in transportation, distribution, and logistics. Like that just, it wasn't even something you thought about or knew, at least I didn't. But I found in this restaurant that I loved leading people, but I didn't necessarily want to stay in food service. I didn't have a passion there. But I knew I loved being a guest at Target. I was just blown away by their them as a company and as a retailer. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, hey, maybe I'll get into like a management program in retail. So I actually applied to be in a store leadership position at Target. And I got called by a distribution center. 
And my very first conversation with them, I was like, I think there's been a mix up here somehow. I don't know anything about warehouses. I don't know anything about distribution. I wanted to apply for stores. But the wonderful HR admin who I talked to talked me into coming in for an interview. I went in for the interview. I did the building tour. And I was like, if they're going to let me play with these toys, you know, conveyors are going everywhere, stuff stacked to the ceiling, forklifts are driving around. I was like, I'm in. Like, I will absolutely learn how to do this and do this if they'll, they'll let me. So I went through, you know, some base testing and an in-person interview process. Uh-huh. But really what Target saw in me and what Target valued at that time, this was like the early 2000s. They were growing rapidly, especially in distribution. They were looking for people who had leadership potential. Mm-hmm. And all my examples were about restaurants and things I'd done in college. And I talked to the general manager who hired me like, you know, a year or so later about why they chose to hire me. And it was all in the way I led people and treated people. And that's what they saw. And that's what they were looking for. And I think that's what, you know, we can go as deep as you want in this, but that's yeah. what translated. Target was so focused on not developing just technical people, mm-hmm. but developing people who could lead people that that's what they instilled and that's what they were looking for. Mm, Very interesting. Do you think, like looking back, thinking out your peers at the time, do you think that that was like kind of commonplace? Like, do you feel like that you were like with like-minded people there as well? You know, that was another thing. The diversity was impressive. They were bringing on a lot of people early in their career, Mm -hmm. but they were bringing on unbelievably talented individuals with a diverse set of backgrounds. You know, it wasn't like you were sitting in a meeting and everyone was a marketing manager. I mean, major in college or everyone was a transportation manager, major in college. (laughs) They had some of that, but they had people who were like art majors and people who I was a political science major. And they had people that were early in their career, people mid in their career. The only common factors were the talent was high, the ambition was high, and the focus on people was high. Mm -hmm. And then they instilled this atmosphere of personal growth and development, being focused on feedback. Uh, They had an entire language for how you talked about strengths and opportunities, and they lived it. You know, at at like that pizza restaurant I was at, they talked about leadership, but they just didn't live it. And, And a lot of companies you see like will have these values, but they don't instill it. At Target, it wasn't enough to be great at delivering a KPI result. You had to deliver a KPI result and you had to do it in a way that your team was bought in, engaged, and in line with the values that Target was instilling in you. And you had to get better and be focused on growing yourself and owning your development constantly. And they lived it. And the managers I worked for, the general managers, the group directors, like they meant it and they lived it. And they instilled it again in that like Mid early 2000s phase, mm-hmm. there was just an entire class of us that went through that process and became true believers <laughs> in that process. Very interesting. And you felt because you started working in the warehouse, right? Yeah, correct. I started as like a frontline, uh, what at the time was called group leader, you know, 30 or 40 individuals on a single shift in a single building uh, leading. Uh huh. So you were managing a team from the first day that you were there. Yeah, absolutely. You go through like a you know, 90 day training period yeah. where you're, but you're learning hands on, you know, your wow. first weekend, your, your work, I was outbound. So I was working in a trailer, building walls of product, but yeah, you're right away, like leading that team directly. Very interesting. And then you did that role. And then I know that you went to a headquarters at some point, right? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I took a somewhat non-traditional role mm-hmm. uh, path. So my first, I was with Target for a decade and the yeah. first yeah. Five years, I was in general merchandise out in the field uh-huh. doing normal warehouse operations at the group leader and senior you know, building level. But then I segued to perishable grocery. When Target went through their P-Fresh change, I moved out to the West Coast and I represented the distribution team with our third party wholesalers renovating the stores and bringing them up to speed on bringing grocery in. We always had super targets that are full grocers, but this was like the smaller little footprint that you see today in most of them. And then I actually transitioned to headquarters 
in a larger role, kind of overseeing the teams that were doing that across the network and ultimately ended up doing process and food safety for both the the target owned food distribution centers and the wholesale business. And then my teams actually built and started up the last three FDCs that they put in place. Mm -hmm. I'll actually go back to this cross-functional development at Target, which is a very another very interesting part. But in terms of like, so you mentioned that they hired like a lot of people from very diverse backgrounds, and it seems like the culture was it actually consistent from the DC into the headquarter. And when you went out to the West Coast, did you feel like it was the same type of culture? Yeah, you know, there's nuance and change in all of it. Yeah. But it's in Target's DNA to be focused on development and feedback. And there's a high level of standard in terms of being forthright in like what you say and what you live from an ideal standpoint. Now, I will say I had just a complete array of different leaders. And it's interesting because I learned something different from each one of them. Mm -hmm. And me today, I'm kind of an amalgamation of each one of their styles. And I learned like the stuff to take and not to take from each of them. And even though they couldn't be more different, the thing that was the same about all of them was this belief in, you know, personal development and accountability and growth and all of those things. Mm -hmm. No, I just find it very interesting because I think that one danger or, or, or complication with the whole the inclusion that debate is like, how do you galvanize all this diversity, all this inclusion into one company culture? How do you think Target managed to do that? Because it's not like a small organization either. It's a huge organization. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to how do you reinforce those ideals? And, and so who you promote, who you hire, who you choose to let go. Leadership absolutely is a trickle down thing, right? And you can have the exact same culture and depending on who the leader is, very different experiences for each set. And one of the things that Target did really well is they don't say leadership is X. They say leadership is this spectrum of different attributes. And when they talk about diversity or they talk about developing someone, they don't say, hey, here's this one mold that is leadership and you have to go down here. They spend a lot of time focused on like helping you assess yourself and assess others to understand within the spectrum of leadership capabilities, like what are the things that you bring to the table? What are the things you struggle with? And rather than focusing on fixing the things that you struggle with, they focus on helping you understand those things, Mm -hmm. but then saying, how do you be the best you? So, you know, this person might bring courage to the table. So how do we really get the best courageous leadership out of them? This person might be a great collaborator. How do we get the best collaboration leadership out of them? This person might be a great communicator. How do we get the best communication leadership out of this person. And when they build a team, they're like balancing these things, right? So you fill in the gaps that you have for each other and you can learn from one another, like here's what this person does really well that I struggle with and how do I balance through that? Mm -hmm. No, and I think that the thing is furthermore is that it's not only that there was diversity in the input of people going in, And there was also diversity then in the output of people going out because I know a lot of people that have done well in Target and people that have also exited Target and taken great roles outside, like C-level roles that actually have very diverse backgrounds. So it's, yeah, definitely. You mentioned feedback was very important at, at Target, right? I think feedback is one of the big things that companies can always improve on. It's not easy necessarily. It's very, it's more simple to give easy feedback, although that can be difficult as well to give good feedback, sorry. And bad feedback is challenging and and requires a certain degree of allowing confrontation, I think. (laughs) Considering that uh, Target is a company headquartered in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Minnesota is known to be the stereotypical Minnesotan personality is Minnesota nice, which for those who don't know basically being, means being very kind, but really avoiding conflict. How do these two things go together? Yes. And 
wherever you are in the United States working for Target, like Minnesota is a piece of it. And, you know, I'm from the Midwest. I loved living in Minnesota. I'm not from Minnesota. I need slightly warmer summers. Uh, <laughs> but feedback is one of the hardest parts of being a leader or being led. And with that, you know, traditional Minnesota politeness, the thing that translates over is assuming positive intent. And there's a way to deliver feedback and there's a way to receive feedback that is open and honest and direct, but is with positive intent and a way to do those things with negative intent. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that Target has done really well is embraced and found a way to scale positive intent. You know, so there's very few interactions where it's you're horrible and here's why, you know, <laughs> it's a lot more interactions of, okay, let's have an honest conversation on, you know, here's what I just witnessed from an interaction standpoint. Here's what was positive about that. Here's what didn't go well about that. And here's how, you know, that could be improved. And it has to be a two-way street. Both, you have to be bought into being courageous and honest in giving feedback, but you also have to be honest and courageous in receiving feedback. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people, we live in a society where criticism is associated with feedback and that's something to like be feared or to push back on versus real strength comes from saying, you know what, like, I'm going to take these things in, I'm going to reflect on them, I'm going to integrate them with the other things I know about myself, and I hear about myself, and I know about myself from personal thought, and try to improve on those things. And, you know, there's this book they made us read early on that was like, called Feedback is a Gift. And, and that might sound like a cliche, but it truly is. You know, if you're willing to invest that time and that energy on both sides, then you can grow and improve. Mm -hmm. If there isn't that positive intent, you're going to be defensive or you're going to be hurt or people are going to be afraid to have yeah. those. Or as a leader, you're probably already going to feel bad about giving feedback to someone. No, if that's kind of like the mental frame that you have. Yeah. And as a leader, you know, one of the things that they taught us was, you know, before you give any feedback to really assess yourself and think about like, what role did I play in this? Mm. And that's a piece I see a lot of people throughout my career not do well. And I'm not talking just the target, but like the world in general <laughs> of there's a something about human nature to see like what's wrong in someone else. But like, if you start with, okay, this person who works for me or this peer of mine, this is what happened. What could I have done better to set them up for success? Or how could I have communicated better? Or how could I have acted in a way that made them more successful? If you go into the conversation already saying, like, I need to be better too. Yeah. Like, there's a shared ownership in that. And that that's not to, like, take it all on yourself, but to be cognizant and aware of, like, look, I played a role in this too. And here's how I need to improve. And part of what I owe is telling this person how they can improve. Yeah, yeah. And if it's even like, it can be as easy as like, hey, my mistake here was like not addressing this thing before, right? Even so there's always something that, yeah, obviously there's always something that we can be doing better. What about like this career, this unusual career path that you had where you saw different parts of the business? I've also talked and I know a lot of people in Target that went from distribution into an HR role um, and into merchandising, for example, and then back into distribution. What do? You, why did they do that? <laughs> why? Yeah, why is a good question. Um, you know, there's this, this thought of like cross-pollinization mm -hmm. and how do you make more robust leaders by helping them understand how the organization at large works? And again, when you start from a place of highly skilled talented people that at their core are good leaders, what you're leading is much less important than the fact you're leading. So yeah. for me, like whether I'm leading people making pizzas, whether I'm leading people packing boxes into trailers, whether I'm leading people setting up transportation networks and cold chains, whether I'm leading people with a startup business, like it all comes back to like, how are you leading people? And if you, when I was at headquarters, I had a lot of members on my one team actually who came from merchandising over to distribution. Oh, wow. 
when you get people who have that like view of supply chain and how the different pieces fit, like instead of having to have, you know, meetings with teams to say, okay, here's how this works. Here's how this works. You have more people who understand like the fiber of how your company works together. And at the end of the day, a big box retailer is a supply chain company. You know, it, it's how is it when, you know, someone in Missouri walks into a Target store or someone goes online to Verishop and looks for a black t-shirt, boom, there's this black t-shirt in this size that I needed. Like, how did that happen? That's supply yeah. chain. And, and the more robust people are in their career paths, um, the more they they can connect those things. And then on the HR side, there's so much focus on people and growth that people who, or leaders who have a passion in that space, like there's kind of a natural evolution into that part of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you took an unusual path, I think, when you left Target, because normally people that start in big companies, at least in the first, let's say, 30 years of their career, remain in big companies, right? Why did you decide to go into smaller companies? So before Berry Shop, I know you're working in another smaller company as well, which you, you contributed to grow, I must say. What led you to this path? Yes. Yeah, so before Verishop, I was with uh, another startup company called Thrive Market. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I joined them around a year into their existence. Yeah. You know, Fortune 500 companies, or I think Target might even be Fortune 50 or Fortune 100, are these big, massive things, right? With thousands of people and structure. And there's so many great things about that. But one of the things about me that I always struggled with in Target is, is I'm very much a change agent and I'm very much a risk taker and I'm fascinated by like what's next. Mm -hmm. And in something as large as Target, you can influence a lot, but you can't like you're not going to move the whole company. Right. And you're going to have an impact on the teams you work with and the part of the business you work with. But there's so much that is outside of just any human being scope and scale to touch on a regular basis. I mean, I'm, I'm sure even the CEO, like there's just parts of the company you can't touch with. Yeah. You were awake every day for a hundred years. I was very interested when I was at Target in things like the work they do with like 3D printing. I was in perishable grocery and I was interested in e-commerce grocery and, you know, Target just wasn't there yet. I was planning on retiring from Target But when I was approached by Thrive Market to do e-commerce grocery, I really looked at the opportunity to be with something early on and influence that and do something different that the world at the time wasn't getting in a great way that I, I made the decision to, to make that move. And then when I, I loved Thrive Market as well, I wasn't looking to leave there. Um, but then when I was a, approached to join a company before it even launched, yeah, Like that, that desire to have my fingerprints on the earliest DNA of the company drew me to that. And so loved my time at Target, loved what I did at Thrive Market, and I'm, I'm loving what I am now doing at Verishop. But it was kind of a move to like positions of being able to sculpt and build things from an earlier stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you reflect on your time at Thrive Market and now at Verishop, how do you think your target background has helped you be successful? Oh, that, man, that's a really good question. I think the thing I had to unlearn the most mm. was just structure and existing resources. You know, when you're at a big organization, like there's already a form built out for everything. There's already a process for most things. And all, all these resources that you're not even really cognizant of as you go through your day. So the biggest learning for me or thing I had to unlearn was, okay, assume stuff doesn't exist. And if you need something, you're going to have to build it out. But what Target gave me was a core set of principles and ideals on how to lead people. It gave me insight on how a successful organization at a massive scale operates. Mm -hmm. It showed me how to be collaborative and deliberative cross-functionally. And it made me versatile. In a startup, Like you have to own everything. I mean, yeah. it's not okay to be like, no, I do transportation and all I do is look at trucks all day. Like <laughs> you, have to, you know, touch all these various parts. And with that understanding of like, okay, here's how those things scale. And here's how 
really smart people that are, you know, a world class company do it and being able to look at that path and say, okay, if we're going to get to that level, here are the things that we don't want to do. And here are the things that, that we do want to do in that space. And then lastly, you know, just setting a high bar for performance and expectations, like in target distribution, there's KPIs for a lot of things. It's, it is not okay to like not meet your targets, right? Yeah. Pun not intended. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> and so coming with a set of, no matter how early we are, an expectation for excellence and performance and, and having strong KPIs and meeting those. Uh, it, when you're target, you got money to burn. You shouldn't because you got shareholders and stockholders and employees. But when you're a startup, cash is critical. So you need to be as executing as well as you can from even early stages. Yeah. And before we leave it, Matt, wanted to ask you, and now that we're entering a supposedly less eventful year than the last one, how are <laughs> things how are things looking for you and, and Berry Shop? Man, things are looking really well. Thank you for asking. I, I can't believe we're actually already this far into this year. It's been I, flying I by. Being a startup, we have all these projects we want to do and capabilities we want to bring in. And when you hit fourth quarter in commerce and retail, you're like, okay, we'll do that in January. Okay, we'll do that in January. We just got to execute right now. January came and there was just this mountain of projects <laughs> for us to go after. So, you know, sales are growing, contribution margins improving. The number of sellers on our platform is a real focus for us this year. And we're adding rapidly so that our customers get better choice and service. We're building out new things in delivery and returns. And the biggest changes are in that that social aspect of our, you know, our iOS app and, and our interface through the feed there. So it's super busy, but going really well. Thank you. Well, we'll have to get the listeners to to keep an eye on Berry Shop, I think. Now and maybe check them regularly and let's see where you are in a year, which I'm sure that you will have advanced a lot. Matt, thanks so much for, after all these years of relationship, joining me on the podcast. Really cool. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was Matt Terry from Berry Shop. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Remember to share, subscribe if you think that the content is interesting. And for sure, please reach out to us if there's any suggestions of guests, questions, topics that you think could be interesting for the show. Have a great day and see you soon.